The Jedi once numbered in the thousands. What's left are a scattered, frightened lot. Mostly beaten and in hiding or poorly trained children like yourself. The rise of the Empire is inevitable. Welcome back, everyone. This is the way. We got some footage from Ahsoka Episode 7, Episode 8. The Star Wars people are always kind of vague about where the footage comes from. Like, is this Episode 7 or is this from the finale? There's a bunch of stuff happening in Episode 7 they have to pay off. A couple huge battles. We're probably getting a little bit more Anakin Skywalker, too, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. They were working on Ahsoka Season 2 before the strike started a couple months ago, so it sounds like we will get Ahsoka Season 2, but they were kind of vague about whether or not that would happen before the Thrawn movie or after the Thrawn movie. I think it just depends on when that movie actually winds up happening. The plan before the strikes was to have the Mandalorian season four be like the last thing before the movie. Like at the end of the Mandalorian season four, Thrawn's actual war, his star war against the New Republic begins. Right now, just expecting them to call that Thrawn movie heir to the Empire just to go full Timothy's on original Thrawn trilogy because so much of what they're doing right now just in the Mandalorian universe, like all the Mandalorian seasons, now the Ahsoka seasons, even the Book of Boba Fett, is riffing heavily on story elements, plot elements, characters from that original Thrawn trilogy. We're also still doing that Star Wars giveaway too for Disney Plus memberships. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber. Just post all your theories for the last two episodes on the video. Careful for spoilers for everything through episode 6 if you haven't seen it yet, but just starting with that scene of Thrawn on the hyperspace ring, the Eye of Sion, it looks like he's inspecting it, they're preparing to jump his Chimera Star Destroyer back to the main galaxy. Now, it's not clear whether or not they have the rest of the 7th Fleet, if it survived the jump to the other galaxy, or if it was just the Chimera. During the end of Star Wars Rebels, where the Space Whales came to the Battle of Lothal to take Thrawn to the other galaxy, you notice here at the battle they have at least three Star Destroyers and the Purgles severely damaged each of them. But when they're actually jumping into hyperspace, their tendrils seem like they're only wrapped around Thrawn's main Chimera Star Destroyer. They almost make it look like the Space Whales totally disabled the other two Star Destroyers and only took the Chimera to the other galaxy. You can see it in the Ahsoka episodes with all the golden repair parts. It's meant to go along with the idea of all the Kintsugi golden repaired Stormtrooper armor. Like Thrawn repaired everything over the past 9 to 10 years in that other galaxy using this golden metal. Definitely makes everything look way cooler, but in real life, Kintsugi literally translates to golden joinery. It's part of an ancient Japanese art of repairing things. They use the same concept for Kylo Ren's helmet during the Rise of Skywalker. My early theory here is that Thrawn only has the one Chimera Star Destroyer, and that kind of explains why there's only one hyperspace ring, because it's just big enough to fit inside the ring. That'll work a little bit like the prequels era ships, like Obi-Wan Kenobi used a starship with a hyperspace ring, which was way smaller. And while Thrawn is traveling across galaxies, he'll just be on the main deck of the hyperspace ring. My early guess right now, though, is that they won't show him actually traveling back to the main galaxy until the finale. But I think that's the whole idea, if it wasn't clear, why they announced the Thrawn movie back at Star Wars Celebration. Like, hey, we're doing this because Thrawn will make it back. Ahsoka, Ezra, Sabine, Hera, the New Republic, everybody will take a massive L in the finale and fail to prevent his return. Episode 7 mostly feels like it'll be a big battle episode with Ezra, Sabine, Ahsoka having a big standoff with Balin Skull, Shin Hati, any of Thrawn's stormtroopers that he sent after them. They're calling them night troopers within the context of the show. The subtitles call them night troopers for night sisters, obviously, implying that some of them are probably already night sister zombies like Maroc. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. The Enoch character everybody was asking about, Thrawn's main commander, is played by Wes Chatham from The Expanse. I don't think he's a Night Sister zombie, and that's why they cast such a big actor for the role. Otherwise, they would just have him keep the mask on. So at some point, we'll probably see him take the mask off. Be warned. Nomads wander this wasteland and prey upon each other for survival. Here are your weapons. Remember, though, Thrawn said his forces had significantly dwindled while they were in the other galaxy, meaning a ton of his troopers had died. That's what's in all the caskets that they've been faring from the Night Sister catacombs. Those look like Imperial design caskets. When he talked with the Night Sisters about ferrying the cargo to the other galaxy and the agreement, quote unquote, that he made with them, the bargain he made with them, the 
The idea is basically that they'll resurrect all of his dead troopers when they get to the main galaxy. They'll become his night troopers too with the red markings and that's how Thrawn gets his huge army on short notice. You'll need the aid of the undead army to achieve victory. Then I will begin the chant of resurrection. They don't need a bunch of force sensitive clones like Moff Gideon wanted to make. That was his plan for getting a super huge army on short notice. But Thrawn still is working with the Shadow Council. Like he needs the rest of the Remnant Empire factions. Most of them seem like they're at least partially on board with this plan to resurrect the Emperor too, which they're calling Project Necromancer. Grand Admiral Thrawn's return will herald in the reemergence of our military and provide Commandant Hux enough time to deliver on Project Necromancer. Based on those Mandalorian episodes with the Shadow Council, it sounds like they plan on using Thrawn's war against the New Republic to stall for time, allowing them to complete that so that they can bring the Emperor back. The thing about that though is that Thrawn doesn't really care about the Emperor actually coming back. He's probably just using the other factions of the Shadow Council to achieve victory, like they're just tools to him. They'll probably reveal more of what his true grand plan is for the galaxy, like he wants to restore the Empire, but his version of the Empire, like one that works better, at least in his eyes, or more efficient version of the Empire. The idea though is that he doesn't want personal power for himself, like he's not trying to make himself the Emperor because he wants power. He just wants to run the galaxy in a more efficient way and protect his people, the Chiss. There was also the scene of him talking about leaving Balin Skull and Shin Hati in the other galaxy with Ezra and Sabine. Like, let's either kill them or if we can't, don't worry about it, we'll just strand them in the other galaxy. They'll never be able to make it back. It makes it sound like he plans on killing the rest of those Purgles too, so RIP Purgles. Hopefully they don't wind up killing a bunch of them. That'd be a really easy way for Ahsoka to take them back to the main galaxy, it's just a ride in the mouth of another Purgle. My early guess as to why Ezra wasn't able to do that in the last nine years or so is just because he didn't have a ship available to him. Like Thrawn kept him on the run this whole time and there weren't available ships for him to steal so that he could take them and ride in a Purgle's mouth himself. But Thrawn isn't meant to be like a psychopath or anything like that. Like he doesn't hate different cultures, other races, the way the Emperor did. It's not like he's trying to wipe out all the force sensitive people or former Jedi. When he was sizing up Balon Skull, he really only regarded him as like a dangerous loose end in his plan. And if there is anything that Thrawn actually does hate, it's loose ends and wild cards that throw his plans off. If he wants to leave Balon Skull and the other Jedi, the Dark Jedi characters in the other galaxy, it's only to remove variables from his plan to retake the main galaxy. Like, oh, you could be a wrench in all these plans, so we're just going to put you off to the side here in this other galaxy. That would also include characters like Luke Skywalker too, but he's back in the main galaxy, so we'll see how they address that during the Thrawn movie. Don't worry, I don't think they're going to completely leave Luke Skywalker, like the other major characters, completely out of that Thrawn movie. That would be super weird to have like a giant Star Wars movie in this part of the timeline and you never ever reference Luke Skywalker. Like I don't think we'll completely make it through the movie without at least some references to what's going on with the major characters during this part of the timeline. But my early hope though is that if they don't do a lot of Luke Skywalker just in favor of avoiding a lot of the weird deep fake uncanny valley stuff, they'll actually do way more Anakin Skywalker world between worlds, force ghost stuff, just him helping out in present day, more Anakin Skywalker in general in present day in a couple of different ways. That'd actually be a pretty acceptable trade off like oh we don't have a lot of Luke Skywalker in this Thrawn movie but we do have a bunch of Anakin Skywalker. There's supposed to be at least a few more Anakin Skywalker scenes in the last couple of episodes of Ahsoka. I believe we're going to see a new scene of Anakin as a hologram in episode 7. Maybe it's part of a moment where Thrawn is sizing up Ahsoka because he told Morgan Elspeth, I want to know everything about her, about her master. So that's probably where that comes from. Maybe Thrawn or some of the others wind up watching holograms of Anakin Skywalker during the Clone Wars like, oh, this is who her master was. And then he makes the connection like, oh, he knew that Anakin became Darth Vader and he knew Darth Vader during the rise of the Empire. Darth Vader had a really interesting relationship with Thrawn too. Like obviously all this came from a lot of the later material because you didn't actually see them meet together in the movies or the series yet. The whole idea though is that Thrawn was part of the regular military like he became a Grand Admiral recently towards the events of the original trilogy like that was a relatively new thing as the events of Star Wars Rebels. Darth Vader wasn't actually part of the military like he had a special position within the power structure of the Empire. He basically was about as powerful as someone like Grand Moff Tarkin but if they were in an actual meeting making actual plans most people would defer to Grand Moff Tarkin and Darth Vader would just have like an equal say in the matter. Generally, Darth Vader did whatever he felt like doing on any given day. Like, he kind of commanded the Inquisitors, but he didn't really care about the Inquisitors that much. They were just pawns to him, basically, to be used. The flip side of that, though, is that Thrawn was way more traditional military. 
Sometimes they would cross each other's paths during different engagements, and Darth Vader didn't hate Thrawn, but he didn't necessarily care about him that much. Generally, Thrawn tried to give Darth Vader as wide a berth as possible, like he had his own plans, and sometimes Darth Vader's plans could throw those off the rails, so he tried to work around that as much as possible. Generally, he was very curious about all Force-sensitive characters, though, and how he could use that to further his plans. Normally, though, he just regarded Darth Vader as a very powerful person that he just needed to keep his eye on. The other major battle that they're hyping up in Episode 7, like I said, is Ahsoka making it back to the planet, finding Ezra and Sabine, maybe all three of them together or separately, having big rematch fights against Balan Skull, Shin Hati, Thrawn Stormtroopers. They're supposed to show off some of Ezra's new Force powers and abilities. He's supposed to be way more powerful, and it'll explain why he doesn't need his lightsaber anymore, and Sabine gets to keep it. It's basically hers from now on out. This might be part of the reason why they've been doing this whole Sabine is a terrible Jedi character arc like Hu Yang just making fun of her for being the worst Jedi ever because they want to show her struggling to use even basic Jedi powers so that when Ezra starts showing off, he seems way, way more powerful. The other thing too with Ezra coming back is that he might become Jason's Jedi Master and I think that's what Dave Filoni is setting up for the Jason character just in general and it's meant to pay off the idea that Kanan, Jason's father, was Ezra's master so now Ezra becomes the master and trains Kanan's son. There are a couple other big questions about the Night Sisters just in general after last week's episode. I talked a little bit about Claudia Black's Night Sister character. They're calling her Clotho, and that's based on Greek mythology and the three Greek fates. Like all the three Night Sister great mothers here are named after fates in Greek mythology. That's also why they were talking about the threads of destiny with Thrawn, because the Greek fates saw threads of destiny. There were a couple of things they said that they could not see the threads of, like Ahsoka. That might have something to do with the world between worlds, what's going on with this weird power on this planet, maybe Anakin Skywalker's storyline. Maybe this will have something to do with Balin Skull's grand plan, the power that he feels on the planet that's calling to him that he wants to end this cycle of Order 66 is basically like, how do you end all war and conflict? That seems like a pretty big problem. That might have something to do with the power of the world between worlds. We'll probably learn at least a little bit more about it between the last couple of episodes. Post all your theories about that in the comments below, though. Like, what is Balin Skull's actual plan? How does he plan to stop war just in general? My full Ahsoka Episode 7 video will post next week after they release it. Congratulations, Danny Logovea. You're the giveaway winner from my last big Star Wars video. Please email me on the About page of my channel so I can get your contact details. Everyone click here for my full Ahsoka Episode 6 video and click here for all my other Ahsoka videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and this is the way.